All right, welcome back. We're um, beginning our um, second video, examining um, the art of the Italian Proto-Renaissance. So let's finally get into some painting, shall we? Um, the art, name of the artist is Berlin Gary, and the title, the St. Francis Altarpiece. Um, it was painted in the year 1235, and I have in um, italics, um, Italo-Byzantine style. And some of you may own textbooks that um, identify this in that um, art historical style. Gene it's still part of the Proto-Renaissance. So why it says that is because we find with Berlin Gary, he kind of exemplifies how these artists have, you know, one foot in the Byzantine medieval past, um, but then they, you know, are start are going to start eventually push things forward. He is the least progressive of the group we're going to look at um, um, under uh, the uh, our program of lectures on the Proto Renaissance. Um, but it's a great benchmark to sort of see that as a contrast to what would come very shortly within a few decades later, okay, with a, other artists we'll meet um, in le our lecture series as well. All right, so who was St. Francis? Well, um, St. Francis um, was founded the, mon the Franciscan monastic um, order. Um, as in monastic, as in monasteries and monks, right? We know monks, they always wear those kind of hooded robes, and that's a very typical depiction when you see St. Francis. He often has kind of almost like this kind of, you know, burlap robe with some kind of a rope tied around the waist, that kind of thing. It's a very typical depiction of St. Francis. Um, what you find with this piece is that it's an altar piece. So that means that it was meant to be displayed in a chapel or a church at the altar end. Um, and it has a large enough size or scale uh, measuring approximately six feet at its at its peak um, to be viewed from a distance, right? Um, so what you find is St. Francis um, who um, occupies, you know, the center of the composition and around him symmetrically arranged little scenes or vignettes of his kind of good deeds and interactions associated with, um, you know, his, his story. Um, he had a whole cult following, not in a bad way, but in, in that he was an extremely popular saint. And so to have him included in, in the 13th century in art was not unusual at all. In fact, even to this day, if you go to some botanical gardens, you find little statues of um, St. Francis, maybe birds sitting on his shoulder. He's, um, you know, preaching to the birds. That's one of his famous stories. Um, you often find him in kind of garden sculpture to this day. All right. Um, the medium is tempera. Now, I'm not talking about um, fried food here. I'm talking about tempera with two E's. Um, tempera is a medium of paint that was common in this age. Um, it's a little bit of pigment mixed with egg. Um, that's the paint medium they were using um, in the Proto-Renaissance. And they'd be painting on wood panel. There's no canvas yet. So these would, are called panel paintings for that reason. Okay. What you find typically that's kind of a throwback to earlier um, art history is you find, of course, the most important subject placed in the center of the composition. And um, that clearly identifies who, who the star of the show is. And you can see that with St. Francis placed in the middle of the composition. His holiness is also underscored by this gold platter halo behind his head. That's a very common thing you see in early Christian and Byzantine art. I have a sample of Byzantine era art um, from the 500s. Um, meaning the year 500 uh, or 6th century um, from the Byzantine Empire, if you're showcasing the most important person in that mosaic, uh, Emperor Justinian, um, with a, a similar gold halo behind his head so because of his close, his, his deep 
Christian faith um, is being demonstrated through that presence of the halo and the church clergy around him as well. Uh, but you can see that central positioning is a great, of course, way to recognize the most important person in a composition as well. His holiness is also um, um, demonstrated by the two angels that sort of flank um, his shoulders on each side of him as well. All right, now you have to see that those little mini episodes of his lives that um, are shown in little, almost like comic book style cells um, are, you know, a benefit for people where literacy was a real problem. So again, the arts, altarpieces, these are really important vehicles to communicate, um, you know, stories that tell stories of, of famous icons in religion, whether it's Jesus and Mary, whom we'll see in a few minutes, or famous saints, that kind of thing as well. And of course, St. Francis, you know, I think his story goes that he was born wealthy. He was kind of a partier, right? And eventually he decided to give his, uh, devote his life to God and gave up all his worldly possessions. Um, so again, the themes of sacrifice, you know, um, are often um, admired in uh, stories of saints. We'll see more um, brutal sacrifice when saints actually get martyred um, um, coming up later in this, um, in our term together here. All right, so very common in art history too at this point, you find the figures are always very frontally faced, right? There's not a big interest in showing anything like a twisted view or a side view or any kind of combination of of that. He's presented frontally. You might notice too that he looks a little odd. He's a little disproportionate. Again, that's sort of, you know, the legacy of what you saw more in the Byzantine and medieval world of, of Berlin Gary's recent past as well, where figures are elongated, kind of stretched out like they're made out of rubber. St. Francis's head, it's too small, right? It's disproportionate. Um, and then when you look at his robes, and we saw this happening even back um, about, uh, well, let's see, what would it be, uh, 700 years earlier in the Byzantine world or later um, medieval, European medieval art, that there's no interest in human anatomy. His robe is there, but it disguises his anatomy. We can't tell if he's got a bent knee. You can't really see any description of the musculature of the body. Um, any of that kind of thing. Um, also, what you find in this particular painting here um, is something called stigmata. So let me advance the slide here. Um, and you can see here these marks on his hands and feet. So I'm pointing to his hands and his feet here. And that's a term called a stigmata. And some of you, if you were in my class, I'd ask you, who would anybody know what that means? And um, many of you would throw your hands up without stigmata, thankfully. But <laughs> what you'd find is, is this is a mark that's like the marks that um, Christ, um, uh, what was inflicted upon Christ when Jesus was crucified, right? He was hammered up on the cross, supposedly by his hands and his feet. Um, so the story goes with St. Francis that one day these marks appeared on his, on his hands, not through some violent event. They just suddenly appeared um, and it was considered um, kind of like a miraculous event. It was considered a blessing from God and then his followers became even more crazy about him like he was some kind of a sec version of a second Christ coming um to you know live among them so it kind of increased his followers to use kind of a social media term <laughs> in that regard so stigmata is something you often find in um, the depiction of holy figures and certainly in the depictions of jesus especially at, posthumously after he was already crucified or in resurrection scenes as well um, so Again, in this, at this point in art history, you find that it's very common to have uh, religious art in the form of altarpieces that are fairly large scale, either you know, life size or larger. Um, and again, all of those visuals for people who can't read are really important um, to tell the story of whatever um, religious event or person they're trying to um, 
inspire the faithful with. Now, it looks a little muddy behind him, but you have to keep in mind that this is probably a poor image, but also it's an old artwork. This would all be kind of a golden backdrop that you would see behind him. Um, very similar to what you would find in Byzantine and medieval art, um, where again, they were less interested in that um, classical world or Greco-Roman naturalism, where again, you know, you could read the body even if the figure is clothed, um, the bodies will be in proportion, but also, you know, by the time you, you left that classical world behind, remember that pendulum swings to less naturalism. And so, you know, you tend to have these kind of, uh, you know, gold backdrops, probably with gold leaf, um, that would be how it would be applied. But, you know, it adds a richness, it adds kind of, you know, a, an elegance, you know, reserved for the most holy subjects and kind of takes them to an ethereal, spiritual place um, that um, ordinary folks wouldn't have <laughs> depicted behind him. There's a little bit in the vignettes on either side of him of some landscape elements, but still leaning pretty heavily into a less naturalistic uh, backdrop. Um, again, focus more on iconic symbols of St. Francis being his robe and his stigmata, right? Um, that's what you find here. So um, this is the beginning of um, um, our unit on painting. So go ahead and click on the next YouTube video and we'll examine um, our next two altars, our next two proto-Renaissance artists. Chimabue and Giotto as we examine uh, an additional uh, pair of altarpieces of the same subject, but done a little bit differently and done with a baby steps towards increasing naturalism. All right, so see you in a minute.